Hi, and welcome back to the Whatever Next podcast, where we talk about all things adoption. I'm one of your hosts, Addie, and I was adopted from China when I was eight months old and grew up in Kansas City, Missouri, where I'm currently based. Hi, I'm Josephine. I was adopted from China when I was 18 months and grew up in London, but I'm currently based in Edinburgh. Hi, my name's Hannah. I was adopted from China when I was 20 months old. Um, I grew up in Dorset, but I'm currently based in Edinburgh. In 2019, we all met in Edinburgh for the first time. Now we've come together to open dialogues about adoption through the lenses of adoptees. In this second episode, we'll be discussing relationships in all forms, such as friendships, romantic, and ones with yourself. So we're going to play some clips again. We've got three different people to share with you. The first one is with um, Hannah, our co-host, and also another Chinese adoptee named Hannah, (laughs) (laughs) talking about dating. And we've also got a clip from me and Rowan again talking about having conversations about me being adopted um, within our relationship. And we also have a clip from an interview with Josephine and her mom talking about different aspects of intimacy, emotional intimacy in relationships, having relationships in the future. How would you guys um, describe yourself as a young teenager just trying to discover your identity and relationship with yourself? And how do you think your friendships changed from when you were in high school to like now as an adult? So like for me, I was very um, like timid and shy. I had a lot of friends, but I cared a lot about what other people thought of me. So my relationship with my friends um, definitely varied. I have had a lot of different like categories of friends that I kept separate for different social scenes and stuff like that. I think we say about categories is quite interesting because I think that compartmentalizing of um, friendships and friendship groups is definitely something that I did as well because it felt a lot easier to have these like separate entities kind of like Venn diagrams than have them overlap because I think also part of it was just like different I think you have different uh, kind of personalities with different people um, but it was just like the crossover of any of those really um, I think frightened me a little bit because same I, same here yeah. mm-hmm. Even, like, mixing friends and family, I find that quite difficult to this day. Yes, yes. I definitely had a lot of anxiety of um, thinking about if one friend from this category <laughs> met another friend from this category, because I wouldn't know how to how to act in front of both of them. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's still me today. <laughs> Super healthy. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. <laughs> but, yeah, there was this one time when <laughs> I had... I think it was at the near the end of high school. I had a New Year's Eve party um, at my house. And this was after I had lived in Vietnam for a little bit. So I had kind of gotten over my um, compartmentalizing different friend groups. And since I was at home back in Kansas City, I wanted to invite like everybody that I ever met um, to my New Year's Eve party because I was so excited on like bringing people together after my experience in Vietnam. So I invited people from my life, like from grade school, from different high school groups, from like work friends to neighborhood friends, like everybody in the same house (laughs) on New Year's Eve. (laughs) And so not everybody knew each other. Everyone kind of like was meeting new people at the same time. But for me, I was like, this is everybody in my life. And (laughs) I remember some (laughs) of my friends being like, this is a really weird, (laughs) really weird party (laughs) because there's a lot of different people here. And yeah, it, like some people I like, felt really awkward in interactions, but I thought it was hilarious. Did it go it was, well? Did they all get on? Um, kind of. Some people didn't really get on. Some people, they def- definitely didn't mingle like all together. There are still groups, which I thought were, was interesting. But for me, I was in a point where I didn't really care anymore. But yeah, it was when you, when I still talk about it with my friends today, they're like, yeah, that was kind of weird. <laughs> <laughs> that was a little bit weird. Um interesting New Year's Eve party. (laughs) (laughs) What do you think, Hannah? Yeah, no, I think at school I had different groups of friends, like you were talking about, like different categories and 
say from from one subject and then another and then it was always weird when you'd meet someone else on the street or something and you'd be like oh yeah and then your friends don't know each other because I haven't introduced them or they just haven't met each other before and that's the same here at uni as well but even I find it so different when you have um, childhood friends versus sort of the friendships at university or at school. Do you feel like that you are a different, or they know a different Hannah, like these two different friend groups know a different version of you? Mm. I mean, my high school friends, or my childhood friends, they have seen me grow up and um, change, whereas at uni, it's sort of that, I don't know, that Hannah at uni and then they don't know much before because it's only how much I tell them um, or mm-hmm. how much I show. I know, I find it a lot easier to um, to kind of talk to people and interact with them like one-on-one or kind of in a lot in small groups. I really dislike group scenarios. Um, they make me my head too. hurt and they give mm-hmm. me a lot of anxiety. I don't know if you guys find that. Yeah, I prefer talking to people and getting to know them one-on-one. Mm. Um, rather than, like, in big groups. Like, sitting at a long dinner table with friends, I don't like. In a party scene or, like, in a social environment, I'm fine with because I can, like, move around and talk to people one-on-one. But, yeah, if I'm in a big group and I feel like I'm having to talk to the whole group, I I just don't. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Yeah, I think that's the same with me. There's When you're in a group, I find that there's sort of just so much to keep track of and you don't know how much everyone else knows and then I feel definitely much more self-conscious and yeah. (laughs) Do you feel like you guys reveal different parts of yourself to different people based on like how comfortable you are or how long they've known you or? Oh definitely yeah I, I think everyone does that to a certain extent but I think you know there's different you have different types of friends don't you throughout your life and there's kind of work mm-hmm. friends and um people that you're close to or people you know kind of glancing social situations that you do keep at arm's length yeah it's so it's weird thinking about I don't know I feel I feel like I've I've changed a little bit since since high school or like if I were to talk to somebody who I met in high school now I would feel like they knew a, diff- a different version of me. Like there was one time I was at um, my old job and I realized that I met this girl um, a long time ago, like when we were 15, like freshmen in high school. And she recognized me and she's like, I think I know you. Like we went to school together like first year. And I'm like, oh my God, you did. We did. <laughs> like you knew like a 15 year old Addie, which is weird to think about because <laughs> I haven't talked to her in a long time <laughs> kind of thing. if you put all of the inclinations of Addy in a room together who would win is it 2021 Addy coming out on top or um oh definitely yeah definitely <laughs> like in a fight <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> fight <with the> Addies. <laughs> yes I would crush them with my emotional intelligence <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But yeah, in high school, I focused more on friendships than I did with boys because mm-hmm. I was just so, so, so insecure. There was, there was not, there's no way that I was even going to think about talking to boys or them, like imagining them talking to me because I assumed that they just wouldn't. So my, most of my high school, yeah, was focused on like friendships and stuff, compartmentalized friendships. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose that ties into Hannah's clip, doesn't it? about her own feelings of going through school and um, talking to boys and that kind of perceived rejection or disinterest. Should we play Mm -hmm. that one? Yeah. I think in primary school, kind of like end of high school, I always remember like, oh, do guys actually like me? Or they just like, I don't know, like, just interested about, like, me being Chinese or whatever. Getting or, like... through the nest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it wasn't even that. I genuinely thought it was, like, the opposite, to be honest. I used to think, like, oh, guys won't like me because I'm Chinese, which honestly is such a, like, awful thing to say. But there was de- I would definitely have that. I'd genuinely be, like... Mm. I think it was just, like, a white guy thing as well. Like, they just wouldn't really... Not that they wouldn't talk to you, but they just, I don't know, they think they maybe, like, were a bit, like, intimidate you by you, just because they were, like, oh, maybe you're, you know... You're different. Yeah, you're, like, a completely different person, which is honestly stupid. But, 
I think I yeah genuinely in like primary school I'd always have that like oh no I don't think that guy would ever like me because I'm Chinese it's just honestly just such an awful awful thing to say yeah it's so sad how we think that or how I definitely felt like that did you guys ever feel like that in high school yeah definitely and Mm -hmm. um as we were saying it's just ironic the kind of 180 that that's done to now I think if a guy approaches me it's the does he only like me because I'm Chinese or because he thinks I'm Korean (laughs) yeah (laughs) it's just yeah you can't win on that one (laughs) what do you think Hannah because that was part of your was it five hour conversation with other (laughs) Hannah about um (laughs) her experiences so she grew up here partly in um England that moved to Scotland so we so we had kind of a similar upbringing in the sense that we were both brought up in the countryside or where it was predominantly white and when when we were talking about that and well when she was saying that 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 sort of made me sort of reflect on oh yeah I I sort of felt that as well especially I don't know um yeah in high school and not really accepting my Chinese features really Mm -hmm. I don't know did you ever feel that I feel like I was aware of having the same feelings that Hannah was talking about. But at the same time, because I had such low self-esteem, I didn't really care if that was like what what people said to me or like um, I just kind of accepted it as is. And like, this is this is the way it is. And I'm just going to have to live like this. Like, for example, there was this one guy um, in high school from first year, I think. He thought it was so funny, like, to call me Ping, like, an Asian, like, nickname or whatever. Like, people, like, other people would just nickname me Asian or he would nickname me, like, Ping and think it was hilarious at, like, um, in social settings outside of school. And I would just laugh along and think it was, like, funny, even though it, like, hurt me inside. I didn't really, like, do anything about it. And then later down the road, I ended up asking that same guy to a dance (laughs) <laughs> and Ooh. I know, I'm like, now that I think about it, I'm like, why did I do that? But that's just an example of how, like, little I thought of myself at the time. Like, even though this guy gave me, like, really awful nicknames, I still wanted to pursue him in, like, asking him to a dance, a high school dance, because I just, because I just wanted to fit in and be accepted. Like, that weighed more than guys seeing only my race. But yeah, Hannah, did, did you find moving from kind of a urban to a rural setting, was that a big turning point for you? Yeah, I mean, so I was brought up in Dorset and then moved, um, went to school in Eastbourne and then that sort of got a little bit more diverse. It was a bit larger, it was a town. And then from then to university in Edinburgh. And I could see that from a, I'm sort of growing up and realising more about sort of my racial identity and then there was more diversity in those two places looking back I can definitely see sort of a change in my attitude towards sort of yeah my self-reflection on who I am a bit more (laughs) all works in progress there aren't we (laughs) this isn't the end yeah (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) when do you at what age do you think that you started putting yourself out there and going on dates um I'm not really sure how to answer that one to be honest um (laughs) I think oh, really? cause I knew I knew the people had crushes on me throughout high school, but I think it was it was that was a very different time to actually being like I want to date somebody. I think it was oh right. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then even I think throughout university and stuff, like I did date people, but I think it was very much. I don't think it was really interesting. This is a horrible, horrible thing to say. And I definitely shouldn't say this on um, on live recording, but I wasn't really interested in them. I think it was more just kind of going through the motions. And because I was like, this is oh, okay. what I think I should be doing. My friends were dating as well. Um, yeah. But I also, I think it was kind of that thing of like self protectionism, um, which I know we touched upon in the last um, disaster of our first recording. <laughs> but like, if you never let anyone in, you never get hurt, that principle. So I was very much like, if I'm not really invested in you as a concept or a person, then it doesn't really matter. Um, yeah, and you're just kind of like there, which just makes me sound like an absolute cow, but um, mm. which it probably no, was. No, no, no. I actually have a, a similar um, experience when I first started dating too. Like, and I didn't really start dating until I was like 19, like 18, 19, and like right when I moved to Vietnam and I downloaded Tinder. <laughs> so I started going on dates through that. But there was this one guy that I kind of saw for a few months, um, and he was from. 
the U.S. as well, um, teaching English. But I was kind of like seeing him and he would come over and hang out with my housemates. And yeah, I didn't really, wasn't really into him. I was just going through the motions, but I thought that's what I was supposed to do, like in yeah. dating. And I remember asking my housemate, um, like, what do you think of him? Like, do you like him? Like, because I, I really wanted to know what she thought of him. And like, so I kept asking, like, what do you think of him? Like, do you like him? And she was like, um, well, I think you should be asking yourself if you like him. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember thinking, like, oh, <laughs> yeah, I, I have guess to so. like him as well. I, I'm like, do I, do I like him? And then I was like, no, I guess I don't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you never really find out how your friends feel about your exes until they're your exes, though. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think like I was also like they were always more interested in me than I was with them, and that was also a more comfortable position to be in because then when I actually started dating uh, Calvin properly, I'm like this that was it still is it's terrifying because <laughs> I'm like I d- I'm really uh, I could really get hurt right now, and I don't like mm. that. <laughs> how long have you guys been together? I hate two and a half years now, and I honestly don't know how. <laughs> <laughs> yeah wow. that's a long time yeah with my, my mom she's like yeah I don't know how I that <laughs> <laughs> do you remember when you first met him like when did you tell him that or talk about your adoption and family and stuff um I think I trauma dumped on the first date um but as we were saying it's it's very much you know part of as you get to know people you kind of you like you know what if you've got any siblings what do your parents do and stuff and so it kind of naturally bleeds into the conversation and I don't I don't really hold back on it. I'm just like, no, nope, my name's Joe and I'm adopted. Um, <laughs> these are my stories. I think that's how, yeah, how it was with me and Rowan too. Like, and, and just in general, like, yeah, it comes up in, in a lot of small talk conversations, mm-hmm. whether I'm, I'm trying to bring it up or not, it just comes up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's one clip that um, I can play now where I asked Rowan, would it have made a difference if I had told him that I was adopted about my family the first day or later? Do you think that it would have made a difference if I told you later when, like after a few dates or, because some people um, ask like, well, especially in dating, do I tell them um, everything on the first date or wait a few dates after we get to know each other or if it doesn't really matter, like the timing, because I guess for adoptees, it's a little bit tricky to decide when to tell people because it throws some people, it does throw some people off. So you never know how people are going to react. Um, so for you, do you think it would have made a difference if I had told you later rather than the first date or? No, I don't think so. It didn't make me think any different on you. And I was really into you, so I don't think it would have mattered. <laughs> so that was his answer. When I was asking that question, I had this one particular interaction I had in mind, like, or a few, because I've I've had had a few first dates where I tell them and then they I get a weird reaction, and the first one was the guy was like, oh, and you're but you're still so normal, <laughs> and was like shocked that I was still there in the flesh talking to him even after growing up with gay moms <laughs> and being adopted. <laughs> It's a miracle. Um, so that was probably one of the top uh, top memories of first dates for me. <laughs> Another guy I remember going on a first date with, and yeah, we ended up talking about family, um, and my adoption came up. And he was talking about his family and how like he came from a very like militant style, and they didn't really have a lot of show a lot of affection, I guess, growing up. So he was asking about what my family was like. And I was saying, no, no, like, my family, um, we're very affectionate. Like, we hug each other, say I love you all the time. Like, we're very, um, yeah, very loving, affectionate, open people. And he was like, oh, but, you know, that's only because you're adopted, right? (laughs) And I was like, what? What? Excuse you, sir. Yeah, that that will definitely stick in my mind for a while. But, yeah, after that, um, I left and didn't see him again. (laughs) But you never know. Yeah, you never know what's, what people are going to say after you, after you tell them, I guess. Yeah. Have you had any weird reactions, Anna, to people? I think always very surprised. But the thing is, when I tell people, it's normally either after a year of knowing them. <laughs> a year? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think even my current flatmate. <laughs> I think just before moving in. 
So it's either brought up if I have known them for a while, um, and it's kind of obvious, but I don't tell them until <laughs> that long. Or sometimes complete strangers, where it's like, yeah, I'm adopted, and and then that is when it's more of a, a no shocked and that lucky narrative mm-hmm. and oh you must be so grateful and everything and I don't know a lot of the responses that we got from the, the Instagram story or highlight mm-hmm. so it's only strangers or people that you've known for a very long time <laughs> no in between, yeah, no in between. <laughs> <laughs> I think it does throw people a little bit though because they don't know how to react and so a lot of it's kind of shock or like they overcompensate and then they also throw in that lucky narrative that gets foisted on adoptees. Um, yeah. And then this idea that kind of, you know, that you've been saved from this this kind of savage country. Yeah. You get a lot of, your parents must be so nice. Yeah, your parents They're are such good people. such good people. Mm-hmm. You're like, I'm a good person too. <laughs> <laughs> I think as a part of it, like, it does, it is a great thing to adopt and it's not an easy process either. So people do have to really commit and jump through a lot of hoops to kind of in order just to have a family but it's not really the end all I mean adopters and adoptees can both be bad people what's some like challenge emotional challenges that you feel like you've gone through being in a long-term relationship I think being in a long-term relationship has its own trials and tribulations I mean you just generally but I think there is the added little caveat of kind of my I don't want to say severe, but although, <laughs> also not medium, um, abandonment and rejection issues. <laughs> like, my skill set when it comes in to, like... In between medium and severe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no in between. Like, four out of five chilies on, like, a spice ratio. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we're in a good day. <laughs> four and a half and a bad one. <laughs> I think my ability to, like... And this is the thing, I feel like I have to gaslight myself sometimes, because I'm like, you were just seeing rejection where it does not exist. Um, I mean, sometimes I'm like, no, that's valid. But yeah, I think I'm definitely like, quite hypersensitive to rejection and abandonment. So like, um, it can be the smallest thing, but I'll be like, the way you shot that fridge was a bit cold. Do you still love me? <laughs> <laughs> was it the freezer or the fridge? Yeah. <laughs> it would be even colder. I'm not saying this is healthy. <laughs> yeah, I definitely experienced um, opening up to Rowan being in a long-term relationship. It took longer than, I don't know, what's, I don't want to say normal, but... What is normal, though? <laughs> I don't, yeah, exactly. Like, I don't, we don't need to talk about what's normal, because... <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, it took me a long time to really feel, like, emotionally vulnerable with him, because yeah. I don't want to be, experience that rejection that is so, like, deep. <laughs> yeah. But because <laughs> it's really really scary putting yourself out there and also just like the knowledge that this person could kind of crush you in seconds mm-hmm. if they really wanted to yeah I feel like especially in um not just romantic relationships but in friendships I always have in the back of my head ready to yeah cut them off if they ever if if something ever happens to just be mentally prepared <laughs> Do you want to introduce the clip that you kind of talked about this a little bit with your mom um, in her interview? Yeah, so um, the clip we're going to play next, it's part of a um, a larger interview with my mom. And we went into a lot of things we hadn't spoken that much about because we've spoken quite a bit about going back to China and finding my birth family. Um, and we do cover a lot of that there, but we hadn't really kind of ever spoken about actual finding them that kind of day. Um, but we also then moved on to uh, relationships and my four out of five chilies worth of abandonment issues where she was <laughs> um I mean she's known me from an infant to an adult so she's probably the best um qualified person to to judge on those and to read me to filth which she does but anyway <laughs> moment they showed any negativity towards you they were just out (laughs) out because for you any kind of rejection is obviously incredibly painful yeah and therefore rather than undergo any more any more risk of rejection you would rather cut people out of your life yeah so you know extreme sensitivity to rejection has has been you know been evident you know watching you grow up and watching you have various friendships how do you feel it's affected your it's affected your relationships 
think my appraisal is... No, I think it's a very accurate read. Yeah, rejection and abandonment are big ones that I do struggle with. I do, yeah, I told you I wake up in the night sometimes I have to poke Callum and Billy to make sure they're still breathing because I'm just worried that they've gone and died on me. They're not allowed to do. <laughs> I think especially in the early days with Callum, I, I definitely see rejection before it, I mean, it, well, it didn't come, but I'd read into things and I get very, very upset about, about that. But then it was just me in my head where I was and I see him and it'd be absolutely fine. And I think I detached myself as well, I think I was just like mentally prepared to cut him off because I was like, this is it, it's done. But then he'd turn up and he'd be absolutely fine and I'd have to back away from that cliff. <laughs> I don't think we're coming off particularly well in this. <laughs> I don't think any of us are. <laughs> but yeah, I didn't really think about um, connecting abandonment with like fear of death until you kind of gave that example of waking up in the middle of the night and making sure that Callum and Billy are still breathing because yeah. I feel like that's huge mm. a huge thing for me as well definitely fear of death of mm. loved ones death is its own form of abandonment yeah yeah mm. but I didn't really yeah I think that those two were together I always assume that abandonment issues meant like people yeah just walking out of your life but not really death itself but I thought that was a good connection because <laughs> I felt like that yeah Always worrying about people dying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or leaving, like you can't, oh. you can't do that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I remember I used to get oh. nightmares uh, when I was like eight about my parents dying, and it was yep, really. Me too, me too. Me Did too. you actually have it? Really? Hannah? Yeah. Yeah. What was yours like, Hannah? No, yeah, I. <laughs> this all sounds so sad. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember sometimes I, I'd be really, really sad and just like imagine. <laughs> Imagine, yeah, that my parents, because they're a bit older than average, I'm guessing, probably same um, yours, and um, there is always that sort of fear of, like, losing them, and I think, yeah, there'd be times where I'd wake up and I was just, like, crying and just, like, thinking um, that they'd sort of die or, or, like, pass away. I never really thought about it, this, (laughs) that, whoa... (laughs) <laughs> me either <laughs> yeah revelation i think that is a common thing for adoptees though to have older parents mm-hmm. and to have to kind of recognize or have to deal with mortality of our adoptive parents because of that like we have to kind of have that in our minds earlier on than the average person who won't really have to worry about that until their 40s really yeah like 30s and 40s but a lot of adoptees who are adopted by older parents kind of have to face that in their 20s yeah. which I think I've been seeing more common now that I don't know we're we're getting older too and it is a big anxiety I don't know about you guys but kind of that I think it's just it's so visceral and it's so kind of in, just intense and acute this kind of like that that even like the thought of um being abandoned again or rejected it is it's such kind of like a primal fear that does yeah to this day like kind of it's, it's she's still there <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah yeah do, do you ever still get anxious now I mean because the... absolutely yeah I don't think that part will ever go away no but yeah I don't know do you feel like people now that we have our platform of whatever next do you see other people on social media or in groups talk about this and like parents being older and dealing with mortality of parents because I feel like it's not a I don't know people don't really talk a lot about it but I think it's so I think it's something that's very important because we're all gonna have to go through it at some point and yeah and I, also for you Hannah as well as an only child that I think that fear is also slightly compounded um, but oh, it's definitely. Not, mm. It's not something that I've seen really online. It's more something that I've spoken to um, fellow adoptees on kind of a one-to-one basis. Yeah. Yeah, I do feel like it's important to, yeah, talk about it, but also to have the support system for, like, adult adoptees. Yeah, who are, like, only children and, yeah, you know. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I've seen a few posts on, I think, the Facebook groups. And, yeah, there are some people who were adopted by single parents and then they have either passed away or 
have like cancer or something and then they're just the adoptees sort of posting it and sort of sharing that worry and I feel like those they, they don't come up often but I always sort of click on them and just like read read the comments and stuff and mm-hmm. I suppose for a few of those people I mean especially if it's a single parent there there might be a kind of issue or feeling of like invalid invalidation when it comes to kind of the wider family maybe not the immediate family but that you haven't got that kind of tie anymore because mm-hmm. and that's back to mm-hmm. biology that some you know um, slightly more distant relatives might not view you as family in the same way that mm. they would a blood relation, which which is awful. Mm. Mm-hmm. So Rowan and Callum are both your first serious relationships, would you say? Yeah. Yeah. How did you get over that fear of abandonment and break down your walls before? Yeah, how did you break down your boundaries and walls? For me, I think it helped when he met my family for the first time relatively early in our relationship um, because I met him in the spring and I had my graduation with the college in Hanoi in August. So we had only been dating a few months, but they had all traveled over to Vietnam to attend it. So he... He met them when he when they came over and they met all of my friends. Um, so that was the first time that Rowan met my family in person. And I think that interaction definitely helped me feel more comfortable talking about personal things with him after he yeah, could see and talk to like my mom, my sisters, um, and really tried to get a, a different understanding of where I come from rather than just me telling him. So I think that was a huge, huge part for me. Andrew? <laughs> um, I'm not entirely sure. Um, <laughs> I think it probably took me being like, I really care about this person and I want to share that part of my life for them. And that was really kind of just a trial by fire thing. Because I was like, you, just, you have to do it, don't you? <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but I feel like I just spoke at him. And I was like, no, 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 no. Like, what? <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, Hannah, you can be the one asking questions now. <laughs> yeah, you, you wait to get your first boyfriend. We're gonna. <laughs> I know oh, we're no. gonna. We have him prepared. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, instead of him being nervous of meeting my parents, it would be meeting you too. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the interesting things that we did touch upon, though, in the last one, is that a lot of people. Um, you said when you tell them that you've got a boyfriend, that they kind of instantly go to what. What race is he as a follow-up? Oh, yes. Yes, that's um, a very common question for some reason. Whenever um, it comes up in conversation that I have a boyfriend, the most of, most of the time, especially if it's another guy who's asking me, um, will ask what his race is. They'll ask, oh, is he Asian? Is he white? <laughs> <laughs> until, until I fill in the blank. And I'm like, why does it matter? Why? But, and then when I answer, is he... Uh, he's white, they'll always be like, oh, do you only date white guys? Or <laughs> if they keep talking before I answer and assume that he's Asian, they'll be like, oh, do you only date Asians? <sighs> but I, yeah, it's very weird. <laughs> yeah, it's that thing where people kind of, they feel the need to to box you. Um, and it's, I think also a part of that question is a gauge to, to work out what sort of, you know, how whitewashed are you? Or are you kind of one of those um, girls and then yeah. they can like move on in their own uh, circle of assumptions and they're like yeah. great that box is ticked let's move on to something else yeah like a very very quick uh, assessment of me yeah <laughs> like I'm in a test like which <laughs> answer is the correct answer I don't know <laughs> right <laughs> yeah <laughs> I'll be like just kidding I actually don't have a boyfriend <laughs> yeah. she's like he's Hispanic <laughs> one of the two options <laughs> he's leaf boy he defies the boy. <laughs> He's a cat, actually. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, people are always curious about Rowan's race. And then they'll want to see a picture of him. <laughs> Just in case you got it wrong. Just in case, yeah. yeah. <laughs> in case you forgot what he looked like. They want to double check my work. <laughs> Do you get that a lot? Yeah, because I'll be like, oh, my boyfriend's in Scotland. They're like, but is he Scottish? And you're like... Yes, okay. <laughs> oh, like asking, is, is he white? Yeah, yeah, because right. that's yeah. the subtext, isn't it? Uh, 
Are you just like, yes? Yes, yes. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Obab. <laughs> but yeah, there is a stigma with white guys dating Asian women, I feel like. Yeah. That's another... It's a whole other <laughs> kind of whole other conversation. That I don't think we have time for in this one, but... <laughs> We will talk about this in another dating-related episode. <laughs> if you're interested in any other questions or comments um, or stories that you want to hear from us relating to relationships. Yeah, because that one definitely deserves the same podcast. There's just so much to unpack there. Yeah, there's a lot so of different much. topics within this topic that I think that, yeah, we have overloaded. could spend a lot of time on. Yeah, and I think it's a shame that we'll we've ended up doing some of them an injustice just by kind of merit of a conversation mm. a dialogue flow that but yeah hopefully we'll come back we'll circle back and if we did yeah. miss anything major please uh, just message us call us out yeah and our email is whatever next 2020 at gmail.com thank you <laughs> <laughs> but yeah we definitely want to hear your thoughts what you think which parts you thought were most um interesting relatable um unrelatable or unrelatable yeah boring all of the things boring <laughs> the whole thing <laughs> whatever next has chosen to help support rape crisis scotland uh, because of all the work that they do to help end sexual violence uh, they work with 17 independent local rape crisis centers spread across scotland as well as running a national helpline year-round to support anyone affected by sexual violence uh, they also work with schools to help teach consent and safe sex and campaign to change legislation and attitudes that allow sexual violence and those who practice it to prevail. Um, it goes without saying that ending sexual violence is a matter that each of us take very seriously. Um, and that's why we've decided to donate the profit raised from some of the stickers that we're selling to Rape Crisis Scotland. If you want to head over to our website, um, they're on sound also through our Instagram if you just want to DM us. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Whatever Next. You can find more of our episodes on Acast, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. With thanks to Andy Lum for editing and mixing this episode, Whatever Next is produced by Solus Sounds. 